and welcome once again to The Blueprint. It is Canada's conservative podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakesbrock. Thank you very much for joining us today. As I said, every single week, new content every Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We thank you. You are the hardcore. You're sticking with us, and we will provide you that content, allowing you another side of the story, something you might not hear from the mainstream media. We have a great show for you lined up today. I know I say, say that every week. This week is even truer than ever before because we have a topic that I think hits almost every riding in Canada in some way. We're going to talk agriculture momentarily, but we need you to get this message out. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda by liking it, commenting, subscribing, sharing this program. And if you can't listen to it all in its content today, you can download it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Google Play, Spotify, you name it, it is out there. So we do appreciate that. So without further delay, we do have the guest, Leanne Rood. She's the Member of Parliament for Lambton, Kent, Kent, Middlesex in southwestern Ontario. She's also the Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. We thank her very much for joining us today. Thank you, Jamie. Good to be here. Well, this is a big topic. Like I said, I think uh, no matter where you live, urban, rural, agriculture affects every single Canadian. And I I must say there were pretty much seamless efforts to ensure that our food was flowing, our supply chains were strong, and our grocery stores, even though we were in the middle of a pandemic, remained strong with food on their shelves. Absolutely. And we really do have Canadian farmers to thank for that. They're very hardworking and they worked with labor shortages this spring. They worked against all odds. We had some inclement weather in some areas of the country and they really are true heroes for all Canadians. Now, there were some issues at the beginning because growing season is very short in a lot of cases. And when farmers rely on seasonal agriculture workers to help out on their farm and, and off air, you and I were just talking about 60,000 of them come into Canada every single year to help ensure that our fruits and vegetables and other items are, are getting out of the ground and, and into the next chain of uh, of events, so to speak. So why don't you talk, tell, talk a bit about that and the importance of the, the seasonal agriculture workers to our industry in, as a whole? No, you're so right. What most Canadians don't realize is that we rely on a lot of folks who come up from the Caribbean, from Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, from many countries to help produce food in Canada. It's mostly in the fruit and vegetable industry, and we do have upwards of 60,000 or so people who come to help ensure that our farmers here have the labor that they need to be able to plant their crops, to harvest their crops, um, package uh, goods that go into grocery stores right across the country. So they are an integral part of the food food supply system in Canada. And a lot of times we don't hear the positive aspects of what these folks bring to the table, but these are folks who want to come to Canada. They want to work. They want to help Canadians. And then they actually bring the money that they make home to their home countries. And the good news story is that that Canadians help. It's part of if we think about it as an international aid program, Canadians are helping folks come in, help us with our food production here in Canada. Those folks bring the money home. They help supply needs to all of their extended family members. Uh, I've heard of folks building schools in their home communities. So there's a lot of good news stories that come out of, of the food production that we see here in Canada and the workers that come to help us. Now, farmers in general, I think they are world leaders, especially in Canada in embracing new technology and new ways of doing things. So it helps reduce their footprint, uh, so to speak, with, within the environment. And and every time I speak to a farmer or I speak to people in, the, in advocacy groups, they're always talking about the use of technology, the use of innovation to make them even better and more efficient. No, you're absolutely right. When we look at packaging produce, for instance, that's what I grew up in. I grew up in the produce world. So um, we have robotics now in our packaging systems. There's fully automated packing lines with grading machines that are fully computerized and automated. There's so much technology built into agriculture now that it it does take out some of the need for um, this 
the folks that we can't find when we have a labor shortage, but it also helps production go faster and make sure that we can continue to be consistent uh, with uh, all the food um, security and uh, health and safety guidelines that uh, most packing houses have to go through. So we have technology from GPSs and combines and planters that help precisely uh, navigate a tractor, for instance, in the field right down to a GPS point. So if you're a farmer who's planting many varieties of, of a crop in a field, you know exactly where it is. There's uh, auto steering components on a lot of the equipment that farmers use. There's, um, there's machinery that needs welders and we need millwrights to work and keep all of the equipment up, mechanics, there's farm trucks, there's lots of uh, equipment that needs to be serviced. So when people think farming and agriculture, it's not what you used to think. It's actually very high tech now, and we require a lot of skilled labor to be working in agriculture. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's kind of a, a topic that gets overlooked in some cases. When you are a farmer today, it's not you plant the seed and you walk away. There are so many different facets to that that operation. You're a mechanic. You're you're almost a trader in, in some aspects. You, you're an engineer, you're an environmentalist, you're a conservationist, and, and the list just keeps going on. So it, it, isn't, it, it isn't just one thing a farmer does, it's a whole series of events uh, within the trade that make it a very noble profession. And something I think the industry in general, along with other industries like skilled trades and, and that sort of thing, getting the younger generation into that line of work is something I think we have to work at as a federal government, provincially, territorially, even municipally, because uh, there, I think we're coming to a time when the number of, of farmers very soon are, are going to be significantly reduced. So we need that younger group to come in and fill that gap. No, you're absolutely right. And when we look at and I keep going back to fruit and vegetable production, but that's our staple. That's our, our um, perishable goods here in Canada. It's very labor intensive. There's a lot of jobs that just can't be done with machinery and it does require hand labor. It requires skilled labor to be able to uh, run the different machines. And, and, and we need to make sure that kids growing up know, I, I personally have a passion for educating people where their food comes from. So I think it's important that we start to teach kids at a young age that there are very noble jobs in an agriculture industry and we need to encourage young people to get into the profession of food production or we're going to see uh, it decline here in Canada and we're just going to become completely reliant on on fruits and vegetables and food from around the world instead of right here in our own backyard where we have the best soils and the best climates for a lot of the production that we do here in Canada. Agriculture, like I think any other industry, I don't care what it is, at the end of the day, you need to be able to, to make money in order to make it work. You need to be able to, to take home a paycheck, however that comes about, and, and feed your family, and, and maybe hopefully have enough over to have the discretionary spending to go on a vacation or, or do some things that make life just so uh, much more enjoyable. What I think we're dealing with on the federal government in a lot of cases is a government that imposes rule, regulation, red tape upon the agriculture industry to the point where some are getting squeezed out. And when people talk about they, they don't want the big farming operations in, in their backyard, well, this I think is a result of, of endless government policy. But not only that, we heard about the carbon tax being increased right across the board. So if you're, if you're a suburban, individual you're driving you have to drive into uh, the city or, or another area you're you're going to see more money put into the price of a liter of fuel this impacts the farmers as well because they have to dry their crops they have to do a whole bunch of things so right now the carbon tax is about 30 dollars a ton now in about 10 years 2030 the liberals are increasing that to 170 dollars a ton what does that mean for the average farmer that has to eat that or try to pass it along, in many cases they can't, to the consumer, which then would pay higher prices for groceries, which are already extremely high. I know there was a lot there. Try to, try to uh, pick what you want from that. No, you're absolutely right. And I've been fighting very hard uh, against the carbon tax for on-farm fuel use of propane and natural gas uh, for farmers, because 
there is no cleaner option or no other option period for drying grain for instance i have had some of the farmers in my own riding show me bills of eight thousand dollars of a carbon tax for one month of drying their grain or their corn and when you have a really wet year you have to dry it to a certain uh, moisture content in order for it to be um, stable enough to keep over the winter or to be able to ship it down to an ethanol plant for instance to be used and I've had, a, we've seen this week actually a farmer, I think in Saskatchewan, where his carbon tax bill for irrigating one month was $18,000. So if we see the carbon tax increase by what the Liberals have said they're going to, it's going to squeeze farmers out of business. And like you mentioned, in a lot of cases, there is no one to pass those costs onto. The farmer right now is eating those costs into their, out of their own, um, cash flows and and they have no way to recover that so inevitably the price of groceries is going to go up and I think we saw a report come out last week that said that the price of groceries is going to go up about $700 per household next year which is one of the highest rate uh, hikes for groceries that they've seen in decades and part of that if you can imagine if this carbon tax goes up and farmers have to keep paying this to produce food here in Canada it's just going to push our grocery bills even higher and right now we're seeing big grocery giants who are kind of taking uh, a bit of um, a, taking more out of farmers right now. We have Loblaws, we have Metro, and we have Walmart who have said this summer that they wanted to increase their fees for uh, suppliers. So food processors and farmers would be included for the privilege of selling to their stores. So these farmers already have to pay fees to sell to the stores, but they want to increase their fees by as much as 6% so that they can pay for renovations to their grocery stores or upgrade their e-commerce or upgrade their computer systems. And this isn't fair to the farmers and food processors. They have nowhere to pass those those um, fees onto, yet these these companies are making record windfall profits. They're, they're 346 million or so Loblaws made in the third quarter, which is out of this world. That's one quarter. And so inevitably, if we don't come up with better policies that are, are good for farmers, and if we, you know, for instance, getting rid of the carbon tax, we're going to see grocery bills skyrocket and that's going to touch every single household in Canada. So I've been pushing uh, at the federal level and we've actually seen some traction now and I've been talking with independent grocers. We need a grocery code of conduct in this country so that these big grocery giants all have to play by the same rules and all of the suppliers who supply goods to these groceries stores will be able to play by those rules as well so that we don't see the smaller independent stores being pushed out of business because they can't get uh, supplies or food into their grocery stores because the big grocery giants that have all these fees, um, for instance, they would charge a penalty if they if, if a company doesn't ship what they're supposed to, they get charged a penalty. So of course, it's going to go to the grocery giants and not to the independent stores, which are the backbone of a lot of our rural communities. We just have independent stores in the small towns. On top of what is going on at every level of government imposing on agriculture, and yes, there, there needs to be rules and regulations uh, governing any industry, agriculture included. I think it's the over-the-top rules and regulations that that drive uh, a lot of farmers out of the the business and the operation. But you touched on a good good point there that that nobody goes to work. I think to break their back every single day to pay more in taxes. And and if we actually want to ensure that groceries, the price of your food, is at a reasonable level, we have to stop imposing one tax after another and everything that goes along that chain that increases incrementally the price of the final product because what's happening and what is happening not just in agriculture but Leanne you'd know this in other industries you have what's called carbon leakage industries go elsewhere to produce goods in jurisdictions that don't have a carbon tax and then we have to import those goods back into Canada and and it puts us at a competitive disadvantage which I think in general hurts the Canadian individual because the jobs are lost and you're paying prices that go to companies and industries outside of your own country. No, you're absolutely right. And in my riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, we do grow a lot of corn for the ethanol plant that's located down in Chatham, for instance, but we're so close in such close proximity to the border with Michigan that it's easy to import corn 
across the border that where they don't pay a carbon tax, where it's even cheaper than it is for the plant to buy the product off of the local farmers. And if we're not careful, and if we keep putting one tax on top of another tax on top of another tax, it's going to squeeze us right out to the point where some of these plants have actually said uh, in, in the ag industry, if we see any more taxes or we we see the, for instance, the clean fuel standards, that's a whole nother topic to talk to touch on. But if we see more regulations and more taxes, they're gonna go south of the border where they have to pay less. And then that puts us at a complete uh, competitive disadvantage and then we're paying more to import it rather than actually producing it here in our own country. I think what gets missed sometimes in this discussion is that the end product, whatever it is, has a set price that the market is willing to pay. So if the average individual says, I'm willing to pay up to a certain point for whatever it is, it, it could be, I don't care if it's carrots, it, a, a going out to the movies, a meal at a restaurant, there is a certain point based on a scale that they will pay. All these taxes, all these rules, these regulations that incrementally increase the price of that final product, at some point it goes past that, that mark where the great majority of people can afford that product. So it just doesn't get bought or they move elsewhere to produce it so it can get bought and purchased for that price the market is willing to pay. So let's stop pushing industry, pushing our farmers out of the business with endless rules, regulations, and red tape that only put them at a severe disadvantage. No, absolutely. And I, it's important that we have some regulations in Canada, and Canada is known for our high food safety standards here. Uh, and it, it is important that we have that, but I think there's also ways which we need to look at some of these regulations year after year and make sure that they're modernized and they keep up with the times because as technology evolves, as uh, advancements in science evolve, some of these regulations need to be changed. And we also see that they aren't changed and they're actually impeding farmers from doing what they do best and knowing what they do and growing their crops. So it's important that we take away as much red tape as possible and give farmers the freedom to manage their land manage their crops to the best of their abilities because they are the ones who do this year in and year out and they're the experts in their field. And that's why I started off the program talking about the innovation, the technology that farmers use every single day because they are the best stewards of the land because of course their livelihood depends on it. But I think it goes even further than that because they actually care so much about the lands they are working and, and the, the impact on society as a whole. So to, 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 to say that farmers aren't doing their fair share, I think is disingenuous and absolutely ridiculous because they are in a lot of cases ahead of the curve. Sure, more work needs to be done, but these farmers are willing to do it and they're already moving in that direction. But we also need technology and innovation to keep up with that demand that is going on in the field or on their individual operations so that they are able to purchase that at an affordable price. No, you're absolutely right. And I'm glad you touched on the fact that farmers are stewards of the land because coming from a farming family myself, I know we if we don't have good soil and we don't put the nutrients in it and we don't take care of our land, that's our livelihoods at stake. And any farmer will tell you that. And I think farmers are completely undervalued when it comes to what we do to help the environment. If you look at all the crops we plant and the carbon that gets sequestered into the crops that we plant and the way that uh, technology has come come so far, like no-till land right now, we're, we're doing things where we're making things better for the land and better for us for growing our crops. And as things evolve, as science evolves, as we learn more and more, we, we want it we take care of the land and all farmers want what's best for that land because like you said it's their livelihoods at stake if we don't so do you want to talk about the clean fuel standards quickly you mentioned that a few seconds ago uh, do you want to talk about that because i think some people in in different industries have said that this could be worse than the carbon tax in terms of impact on the economy impact on industry and the price of goods and services right across the board yeah, and, and we'll see a couple of different things with the clean fuel standards. One, we haven't actually seen them yet. We are hoping or hearing that they're supposed to be coming through the Canada Gazette process here, I think, next week. So there were some concerns 
about land use and the government dictating how the land could be used by farmers who want to plant feedstocks for biofuels. So we're hoping to see that they've taken into account and consideration what industry has suggested. And but on the flip side, there is good things because we're going to see more canola, for instance, produced in in Western Canada that will go into biofuels. And we're going to see more corn being produced to go into the ethanol plants. So there are some good things, but there, I think there's a lot, a lot that we still don't know about these clean fuel standards. So I think we're just going to have to wait and see what happens when they actually get gazetted and see what they say. And then we'll be able to talk talk about a little further. I should have asked right off the beginning, you have a background in agriculture. Maybe you can tell tell us quickly about that and tell us how, how you, uh, you know, your family started with an operation You uh, and you were right there, right from the beginning, obviously. And uh, you, you, you learned a lot from that experience. I did. I, I do. I come from a vegetable farm, like I mentioned before. My grandparents on both sides of my family actually were immigrants to Canada. So they're a great Canadian, true Canadian story where they, my dad's folks were immigrated from Holland. My mom's folks immigrated from uh, Germany via Poland, via Germany. And they started working in tobacco fields here in Southern Ontario and were able to work their way to the point where they bought their own land. They, they in some instances, cleared their own land and started farming in the Grand Bend area. So uh, my dad's side of the family was one of the first six, uh, I guess we call them settlers in the Klondike Marsh outside of Grand Bend. And they would grow vegetables. So a lot of lettuce and onions. And my mom's family grew anything from carrots, lettuce, onions, onion sets, and then we ended up with about a thousand acres of potatoes. So it wasn't wasn't a small operation, it was quite large. So I'm a third generation farmer and my brother and I still uh, sell potatoes today and uh, we're, we're proud to carry on the tradition that my, my family has had for years and years. All right, we have to close it out very shortly, probably right about now. So I'll leave the final word up to you. I just want to say to all the hardworking farmers out there, it, it's been quite a year and thank you so much for persisting through weather, through the pandemic, through the labor shortages and every Canadian should be so grateful for the hard work that our farmers do. So thank you very much. A perfect place to end it. Thank you, Leanne Rood, Member of Parliament for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex and Southwestern Ontario and Shatter, Shatter, Shadow Minister, there we go, I can say it, for agriculture and agri-food. We appreciate her time. So many more questions about that. We'll get her back on the program a little later on to really dig deep and maybe we might have some more details on that clean fuel standards that will impact not just agriculture, but other industries as well. So thank you again. New content every Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. And of course, next week, you'll want to tune in for this, seriously. Aaron O'Toole, the leader of Canada's Conservatives is going to be our guest at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time next Tuesday. Make sure you tune in for that. It'll be a, a pre-Christmas episode and of course as i said new content every single week we will have that for you right through the holidays right into the new year we do not stop there's so much at stake here in canada and we want to ensure that that message continues to get out there so please we need your help to do that we need you to like comment subscribe share this program if you can't watch it all now download it listen to it on platforms like spotify google play itunes you name it, it is out there. Together, we can push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. So we will see you next Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Aaron O'Toole will be here, our, our guest. Thank you to Leanne Root for being our guest today. Remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint.